Usually, people do not suddenly fall into immorality and sin. It is a slow process. They play with the idea in their mind. They fantasize. They get the courage and they go for it. They slip into sin a little bit at a time. They do not intend to remain there in sin or immorality or evil forever. They intend to get out when the time is right. But they do not realize what has happened to them. They did not know that sin has such an awful hook. Sin is like a strong wild flower with huge roots. I was going to say weed, but I didn't want to trip you with the, the pun. <laughs> anyway, they are now trapped in the grip of sin. They are stuck in their wicked ways. They hate what they are. They hate what they do. They want out of it, but they cannot. They are trapped. They have been captured by the grip of sin. Anyone who allows sin to take root in his or her life ends up in this situation. A temptation entertained today, a fantasy enjoyed today, become sin tomorrow, then a habit in the next day, and eventually an unbreakable addiction that leads to death and separation from God forever. The first step towards a hard heart is thinking that we could never become that evil. That would never happen to me. In the life of Lot's wife, we learn that a divided heart is a dangerous heart disease. Hardness of heart is dangerous, a dangerous heart disease. This morning in our text, we are going to see the result of this heart disease, the result of hardness of heart. Today, we will see many sinful people going through terrible torments and plagues who will still refuse to repent from their sin. They will continue to worship demons and idols. Today, we will learn about the grip of sin. So please turn with me, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, as we continue where we stop. Chapter 9 has two simple parts, two frightening armies being released and allowed to judge mankind. The first army is from the pit in the first 12 verses. <clears throat> the second army is from the east the last 19 verses. So let's start with the first army. John continues the story of the great tribulation. And he says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So when the fifth angel sounded the fifth trumpet, John saw a star fall from heaven. He did not say that he actually saw it fall. The Greek word said that it had already been down. It had, it had been fallen past tense. When John saw it, it was already fallen. What is this fallen star? 
This fallen star is not celestial nor heavenly, like in chapter 8. It is a person. Personality is given to this star using the word to him. It's a person. He is a bad angel. Good angels do not fall from heaven. He is the king over those in the pit, someone you do not want to meet or to deal with. We will see him in verse 11. Job chapter 38 also refer to angels as stars. This star here is Satan. Even in modern terminology, it is normal to speak of an athlete or a performer or a movie person as a star, a movie star. In chapter 12, he will be finally expelled from heaven permanently. Now, notice that he does not have complete authority. The key has to be given to him before he can loosen his army. He does not have the key. This star is Satan. His army is made up of demons. Another thing, he is not in the bottomless pit himself. He opens the door from the outside. What is this bottomless pit? The Greek text says it's a hole without bottom, an endless shaft, a limitless tunnel. The bottomless pit is literally the pit of the abyss. Luke makes it clear that this is the abode of demon in Luke chapter 8, verse 31. When Jesus met that mean guy, Legion, in Gadara, the many demons who had entered him asked Jesus not to send them into the abyss, this place. Again, the same word, the bottomless pit. Later on, when we are in chapter 20 of Revelation, John will mention that Satan will be temporarily jailed right there during the Lord's reign on earth for 1,000 years. Also later in chapter 13, we will be introduced to the false prophet, the beast who comes up from the earth, who looks like a lamb, but who is really a dragon. We are told that he comes from this place, the bottomless pit. This bottomless pit is not the eternal lake of fire, the final prison for Satan and those who follow him. But it is part of that hidden underworld kept under the Lord's authority. At this time, this fearsome army described here is locked up. They are waiting for the hour of liberation. Somewhere in this world, there is a shaft that leads from the surface of this earth down to this bottomless pit. Might be in Oregon. (laughs) As the door is open, in verse 2, John could not see inside. There was too much smoke. And no, you cannot use the scripture against smokers. This is not where they go. Smoking is a bad, unhealthy habit, but it is not a sin against God. Some people stretch the verse about our body being the temple of the Holy Spirit and use it against smokers. 
need to be gracious, give them time, pray for them, they'll quit. John said that the smoke came out as the smoke of a great furnace, not of cigar or cigarette. It's interesting that Jesus compared hell to a furnace of fire in Matthew chapter 13. Remember when Abraham looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19 after God had destroyed these cities? What did he see? He saw nothing but smoke ascending like the, the smoke of a great furnace, like here. And there in Genesis 19, that's the first mention of smoke in the Bible. John goes on. He says in verse 3, Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Through this thick smoke, locusts came out upon the earth. We are not told how many they are. What are these locusts? They are an army of demons who have the appearance of locusts. So they are compared to locusts in verse 3. The eighth plague on Egypt in Exodus chapter 10 was a devastating swarm of locusts. People who have never encountered these insects have no idea of the damage that they can do. When God wanted to judge his people back in the Old Testament, he sometimes sent locusts to devour the harvest. These here are not literal locusts. Why not? For four reasons. Reason number one, they do not devour the green vegetation. These creatures are prohibited from devouring the green vegetation in verse 4. The normal diet of a locust is grass, trees, green things. But here they go after people. That is weird. Reason number two, they have intelligence. They are able to discern between those people who have the seal on their forehead and those people who do not have it. There's nothing worse than a smart locust. Then reason number three, their torment is like the torment of a scorpion. We will see in verse 10 that they have tails like scorpions and stings in their tails. Normal locusts do not have such tails. The scorpion ranks with snakes because of a venomous sting that they have in its tail. The locust is not like that. And then reason number four, they have a king over them. I told you they were smart. They voted, they appointed a king. Proverbs 30, 27 state that a normal locust does not have a king. But these demonic locusts here have a king. This is not a discrepancy. Solomon is talking about real locusts. Here, John is talking about demons and their king is Satan. 
This demonic army is given a specific assignment to torment all those who have not been protected by the shield of God. They are to go after those who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. Who are these? That is everybody on the face of this earth except the 144,000 Jews who have received the seal of God in chapter 7. All Israel escaped the eighth plague of, of locusts in Egypt, but this time only 144,000 Jews are exempted from the attack of the locusts from the abyss. Because of their seal, they have a special protection by God against these demonic creatures. This army tortures all those who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. Verse 4. They are not given the authority to kill anyone in verse 5, proving that they are totally under the authority of God. God is in control. Their power is to torment people, but not kill them. The wound of a scorpion is not usually fatal, but it is exceedingly painful. I'd rather have a root canal than be tormented by this scorpion. For five long months, that is torment, but no death. If you have ever been stung by a scorpion, you understand the kind of pain that is mentioned here. The normal lifespan of a locust is about five months. They go from April to September. And this is the length of time for this judgment here, five months. We have in verse 6 the extent of the pain, the extent of the torment. It is so bad. People want to die. They seek death, but they are not able to die. For five months, there are no obituaries. Death is on vacation. Even those trying to commit suicide do not succeed. Nobody dies for five months. It will be a horrible time. Death is sometimes a blessing when the suffering is more than people can handle. So it will be a great torment with demons inflicting pain like scorpions, with no way to escape it, even through death. Their spirit will not leave their bodies. No separation. It is God who releases the spirit out from a person's body. He does that. The real person is the spirit that dwells inside the body. God has the control of it. The spirit is eternal with a consciousness that will never stop. When a person's time is over or when a body is no longer capable of functioning properly, then God releases the spirit from that person. It is called death. But it, all it is, it's a move. It's not an end. The spirit moves somewhere else. But for these five months, God will not release any spirit from any person. Nobody moves, nobody dies. So those who have purchased farms in Oregon or in the boonies, Montana, 
and I've stocked them all up with fresh water and canned goods galore and are ready to escape the rule of the Antichrist. How in the world will they escape these demons turned loose on the earth to torment people? They may have a lot of canned goods, but men are they going to suffer. This is part of the judgment of God. No one will be able to escape this no matter where they go except the 144,000 male Jews. Today, not all demons are rampant on earth, but there will come a day when demonic activity will increase on the earth. For generations, Satan has been invisible, but one day he will become visible, especially during that time. John continues, he says in verse 7, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running to battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. Here we are given more details about the description of the locusts. It confirmed that they are not normal, regular locusts that we know. Remember that John had to describe things he had never seen before in his life. In his description, in verses 7 to 10, he mentioned eight things about them. First, he talked about their shape. He says it is like a horse prepared for battle. Not a plain horse with nothing on it, but a horse prepared for battle. You probably have seen those horses in movies having like a skirt around them and a metal plate over their head with two holes for their eyes. So that's the shape. Then he talks about their heads. He said they're covered with yellow crowns made of something like gold, but not necessarily gold. It could be something yellow in color. Then he moved to their faces. He said they are like the faces of men. Not really faces of men, but like it meaning maybe they have similar feature, two eyes, one nose, one mouth, but something like a man. Then their hair. Their hair are like women's hair. Again, not necessarily women's hair, but like it, meaning maybe they have long hair. Then he moves to the teeth. He said they are like lion's teeth. Possibly big and vicious looking. Then their chest. Their chest is like a breastplate made of iron. The breastplate covered the thorax from the neck to the navel. The scaly black, the, the scaly backs and the flanks of the locusts do resemble somewhat a coat of mail or a breastplate. Then their noise. They make a noise with their wing that sound like many chariots with many horses running to battle. A scary noise. And number eight, their tails. They are like scorpion with stings in it. There is one key 
word in all these verses, and it is the word like. It is a dangerous word. John used it a lot trying to explain things he had never seen before. A man may look like a woman, but he's not. So be careful not to take those things and to make it the chest is the breastplate, the hair is like a woman. It is like, but like is a dangerous word. But how would you like to come face to face with one of those? How can anyone defend himself against one of those beasts? They have power to hurt people wherever they are. And they have it for five long months. Remember that the Holy Spirit is now restraining evil on earth. He will hinder evil until he is removed. When the church is removed because the Holy Spirit dwells in the people of the church. But after he is removed from this earth, look out. You don't want to be here. Some people will turn to God after the rapture of the church and may suffer. John goes on. He says in verse 11, And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. But in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. One woe has passed. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Here we are given more information about the fallen star. The fallen angel that we saw in, chap in verse 1 of the chapter. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, Apollyon. If you take a look at the Definition, both names mean the same thing, destruction or destroyer. So their king is Satan, the destroyer. Jesus said in John 10.10 10, that Satan is a destroyer. He came to steal, to kill, to destroy. Chapter 8, verse 13, clearly specified that there were three woes. Three trumpets to come. Only one is past. There are still two more to come. It does not get any better. Now at verse 13, we see the second part. Now we see the second army. It's not an army of demons. It's an army from the east. John goes on and he says, Then the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. So as the sixth angel sounded his trumpet, John hears a voice from the golden altar. That's the altar of incense. It is not the brass altar for sacrifice. We saw in our last study that there are two altars in heaven, very different one from the other. This altar had four horns at the four corners. The voice come from the four horns. John says it is the altar where the prayers are offered to God. So after sounding this trumpet, this angel is told by the voice coming from that altar to release the four angels who were born. Verse 14. Who are they? 
These angels have to be wicked because no holy angels would be bound. It appears that certain angels are kept by God in chain specifically because of their fierceness. They're too fierce to lose. They are so fierce and horrible that God keeps them in chain for the protection of mankind. Now God loosens four of them, and they are set free upon the earth. Here we are told where they are bound. They are at the river Euphrates. Why there? We do not know why. John does not say, but we know seven things about this area. We know that the Garden of Eden was there. It is the birthplace of civilization. We know, number two, that sin originated there. Number three, we know the first murder was committed there. Number four, we know the first war was fought there. Number five, we know that the flood started there and spread over the world. Number six, we know the Tower of Babel was erected there. And number seven, there the Euphrates River divides the east from the west. So these four angels had been prepared, had been waiting for their signal to move. It does not mean that they knew the hour, the day, the month, or the year that they would be released. We see in verse 15 that they have a job to do, and it's a terrible job. Their job is to kill one-third, 33 and one-third percent of mankind. Remember, one-fourth. 25% of the population is killed at the opening of the fourth seal in chapter 6. Here, one-third, 33% of the remaining people is killed by these fierce angels. By this time, about 58% of the population is gone. If there are 8 billion of people at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, then about 3.5 billion remains. The earth will not be a fun place to live then. Make plans not to be there. John goes on, he says in verse 16, Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had break, break, breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouth came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouth. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. Now, coming from the east of the Euphrates, an army of 200 million. John tells us that he heard the number clearly. But the word million did not exist in his time. The word million started in the 14th century. It came from the Italian language, milione. And the word billion was formed in the 16th century, again by Italians, replacing the M with a by, which is two. 
Most likely back then, it was 200,000 thousands. At the time John wrote this, the population of the entire world was about 400, 500 million people. Such an army was ridiculous. The earth's population did not reach the 1 billion mark until 1860. It is interesting that China has confirmed that they have right now an army of 200 million soldiers in uniform. Napoleon once made the statement, China is a sleeping giant, and God pitied the generation that wakes him up. China is very much alive today. It represents 25% of the world's population. If we take the people of the East and the people of the Orient and the people beyond the Euphrates rivers, we have most of the population of the world. Bible commentator J. Verdon McGee said, Suppose they start moving. That's scary. Napoleon was right. Way back then when he said, do not wake up the giant. McGee also said, I quote him, he said, from the time of Alexander the Great, the white man has ruled. He has had his day. May God help the white man when these angels are loose. He will not stand a chance. That's what he said. He was right. John was trying to describe an army in verse 17 with figures that were familiar to him. Those horses that he's talking about could be tanks shooting fire. From their mouth came three things, fire, smoke, brimstone. The same thing from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Another thing, the colors, red, blue, and yellow, are the colors very popular in China. The expression by these three plagues, verse 18, referred to the fire, the smoke, the brimstone, verse 17. John either explained how one-third of mankind was destroyed in verse 15, or an additional one-third of mankind was killed by these three plagues alone. If so, that would leave very little over two billion people on earth. No wonder the Lord said in Matthew 24, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. The expression in verse 19, their power is in their mouth and in their tail, could be a good description of tanks that can shoot from the front and from the back. No matter what, this is a reference to military weapons. Serpents do not have several heads, plural, but a tank has. So John ends the chapter. He says in verse 20 and 21, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hand, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their theft. The most frightening thing about Revelation chapter 9 is not the judgments that God is sending, but the sins that men persist in committing while God is judging them. You would think seeing those things would make you run to God. It does not. Look at their reaction in verse 20. 
People are suffering. They're dying now, left and right. Finally, the five months is over when they could not die. Now they're dying. The world is in a horrible, dreadful condition. And still the people do not repent of their evil deeds. And John mentioned six specific things in verses 20 and 21 that they refuse to repent from. The first one is the works of their hand. They are hooked on material things, materialism. They're not, <clears throat> they will not let go. They will not stop that. Number two, their worship of demon and idols, idolatry, breaking the first two commandments of God. Number three is their murders. It could be the actual killing of people, the sixth commandment, or hatred, which Jesus said was as bad as murder. Either way, they won't repent from it. Number four, he says they're sorceries. The Greek word pharmakia means drug, drug use, drug abuse. They won't stop that. Number five, their sexual immorality. And this covers homosexuality, lesbianism, incest, fornication, adultery, the seventh commandment, including child molestation and sex trafficking. They won't stop. And number six, they're theft, cheating and stealing the eighth commandment of God. In reading old Bible commentaries written in 1910 and 1920, Men of God could see way back then a day coming when there would be widespread murders, drug problems, open sexual immorality that did not even exist in their days. But we see it today. They were right. It came to pass. So we see in our text today the rest of mankind who were not killed by locusts or by some plagues, still refusing to repent from their sin. How is it possible? What kind of a person would refuse to repent seeing and experiencing such thing? A trap person, a person captured by the grip of sin. He cannot repent. These people were not born that way. They did not become evil overnight. People do not fall suddenly into immorality and sin. They slip slowly into it, a little bit at a time. It is a slow process. They never intended to be absorbed, to be captivated, to be gripped by sin. It started innocently. They played with the idea in their mind. They fantasized. They were not really planning to do it. They were just thinking about it. Then they got the courage. Maybe they heard the Nike commercial, just do it. And they did. Maybe they were mad at someone, mad at something, and they went for it. Because that's when people really go for sin. When they're mad at someone, mad at something. They slipped into sin. They did not intend to remain in sin forever. They intended to get out when the time was right. They were sure they could get out whenever they wanted. But they did not realize what happened to them. They underestimated the power of sin. They did not know that sin had such a hook. Sin has deep roots. They are now trapped by the grip of sin, stuck in their wicked ways. They probably hate what they are, hate what they do. Probably deep inside, they want out, but they cannot. They are trapped. They have been captured by the grip of sin. 
we see here that the judgments of God do not always bring people to repentance. It does not here. These people's heart were so hardened that even those awful plagues did not drive them to God. It drove them further away from God. Their heart was so hard, the hook of sin was so strong, so deep, they could not stop. They could not get out. Job, remember old Job, in arguing his case in chapter 9, says, who has hardened himself against God and prospered? The answer is no one has. There is a warning in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 that says, Encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hardness of heart is a very dangerous heart disease. It can cause people to be trapped, to be captured by the grip of sin. What is the answer? What is the solution? The best thing to do is be aware of the power of sin. Be afraid of it. Do not venture into it. Do not play with it. Do not start the slow process. Do not play with the idea in your mind. Do not fantasize. Be afraid of sin. What may seem like fun has a terrible hook. Stay away from sin so you won't end up in the grip of sin. We see today in our text the grip of sin. Those people had sinned for so long that even what they saw the great judgment of God, things they never seen before, did not convince them to stop sinning. As we continue, we will see again, it's going to get worse in the book of Revelation, and again, people will refuse to repent. Sin has an incredible grip on people. You may wonder, why in the world did Judas Iscariot went to hang himself? That sin of his was so ingrained, he was captivated by sin, he could not repent. The heart is a funny thing. If it is tender, it will Think right, it will do the right thing, it will ask for forgiveness. But if the heart is hardened after years and years of continuing in sin and refusing to repent, it's a dangerous heart condition. I'd rather have a heart problem than that hardness of heart problem is more dangerous. So may the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless each and every one of you who came today, spend time with the Lord. May he touch your heart. May he soften your heart. May he keep your heart from stubbornness. May he protect you from evil. May he protect you from the grip of sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.